I get I be first tonight. Tonight you do, yes sir. <laughs> Let's keep me straight. I will. Good evening. Good evening. You see Willie's not ready. He ain't, say, say what you want to say, Willie. I don't care. <laughs> oh, me, oh, me. I don't get announcements. Uh, young at heart, not this Wednesday, but the next Wednesday. So do that. Uh, group will be going to Natchez on the uh, 30th. Right? Yeah, be Start being in prayer for them. Start being in prayer for Natchez. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I'm only joking about that. Uh, uh, Annie, Annie Armstrong. Margaret, Margaret, Margaret Lackey. Lackey. I can't, that's some reason I just cannot get that in my feeble mind, oh. all right? But do remember that, okay? And we're fixing to see another video in just a minute on that. Because they do, and, and like I told you one time, uh, I, I, our state missions has become so very, very important uh, of what they do and the things that they do. And, you know, we used to count it, well, I used to count it our minor offering that we gave for it, but it's become, a, to me, a major offering in that. We really do. Any other announcement that y'all have? Yes, they took another shot at him, did they not today? Uh, uh, Donald Trump, they, um, he was on the golf course someplace or another, and uh, they need to shoot me while I'm on the golf course. I'm going to have to find him. Uh, anything else? Do remember Patsy this Thursday will be doing surgery. Gary. Uh, I was talking to Melinda a while ago. We're not going to be able to be over there that Monday. I, we're going to be gone. And, and I told her, I said, I hate that doubly from one thing, just not being able to be over there. But man, never been in the hospital in his life. And he goes over and, he, you know, and they do the major surgery on him. And that right there. So be very much in prayer for him as he's doing that. Boo, uh, remember him. It's going to be a tough day tomorrow, tomorrow night. And then for Tuesday, he's... Uh, in there because this radiation, um, excuse me, this chemo is going to work him over. So do remember him in prayer, okay? Uh, there. Uh, also, yeah, Becky Bradbury, uh, J.R. Eaton's mother-in-law, uh, Johnny Kimbrew, M.D. Anderson, uh, Sonny Scott uh, got cancer. Danielle Huffman, Shingles, remember her. Uh, David is not, not not doing well. Tests not coming back exactly like they want them to come back, I think, in that. And the families of, of Brian Aldridge and uh, uh, who that? Oh, Doug Cal Calabrese, is that how you pronounce that? And, uh, and of course, Paul Childress, uh, they said fell and broke his shoulder. Did you know that? I didn't know that. And the collarbone, okay. Uh, in there. I knew he was stumbling around and not being able to do a whole lot in there. Anything else? Okay. Brother David, lead us in prayer, please. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. This day we come to worship you and thank you for Brother Bobby and Diane and pray for my sin. Father, we pray. Continue to lead us, even in your words tonight as we share your message for us. We also pray for these pictures and prayers and many on our hearts. We pray and lift them have a good number of the Margaret Lackey videos, so we're going to see another one of those to start us off tonight. 
it, this is the dream. <laughs> it's this is the, the vision. This is this is what we prayed for for years. Uh, just for God to send laborers into the harvest. Well, we have uh, come today to help work on this house and hanging uh, hardy board. We've also been sanding uh, the sheetrock that needs to be sanded there to make it ready for paint. Um, so we started out by tearing down this wall. First of all, clean up the bricks. They're going to be used to rebuild a wall right away for the park. Hey, Mr. Baptist, we are here with Baptist Student Union all across the state. We've got several campuses that are here in uh, the Mississippi Delta, serving our Christmas in the Delta. Uh, they're serving anywhere from Tuckweiler to Silver City to Rolling Fork and Cleveland and Greenville, all over the place. And the reason we're able to do that is because of your support of Margaret Black and State Missions Offering, helping our students be mobilized and serve on mission here in Mississippi. Focus on disaster relief, church planning, uh, we've got crisis pregnancy center, we've got boys and girls clubs, packing bus and bags, doing prison ministry. You know, shout out to Sam Ozzy and to our local guys, Josh Warren and Zach Hardy, uh, for making all this happen and, and getting these students mobilized. It, it's a blessing as a pastor to see the next generation uh, not only stepping up, but uh, going above and beyond. I think the goal was to have 50 students, over 100 are in the Delta all across, uh, doing a work for the Lord. So. Uh, it's just exciting to see this next generation coming up and really plugging in. We we do this because there are people in our in our cities, in our communities, in our neighborhoods that do not worship Jesus, and so that's why we do it. You know, we're just helping a little bit, just doing playing a small part, coming to help. So if you can pray for our students, they continue to answer the call that God's placed in their life and serve here for the gospel cause in the great state of Mississippi. This be bad. Just thank you for your giving. Thank you for your support. And as always, the issue is to know Christ and to make Him known here in our backyard. <laughs> together tonight, Blessed Assurance. <laughs>
singing with Yes, Lord, Yes. This is a newer little hymn, and we'll sing through this twice. Can we sit down? Oh, yes, we'll sit down. I'm sorry. I left y'all standing up. <laughs> Absolutely. And let's continue our singing without saying Yes, Lord, Yes. I'll say yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. I'll say yes, Lord, yes, I will trust you and obey. When your spirit speaks to me, with my Take your Bible and turn to Revelation, the third chapter. There are three churches there, all of them on the eastern shore, I guess you would call it, the east side of the other churches that we were talking about. From what I understand is, most of those churches were made for one purpose, or the churches, one of those communities was made for one purpose. And they were defensive communities. In other words, when warriors would come through, then those would basically slow them down to where they could not get to uh, Pergamos and to uh, Smyrna and to uh, the coastal cities that was on that side. I don't know a whole lot about those things uh, that was there. 
we're not going to look at the church at Sardis today, but just the, just a couple of things that I want you to notice out of the church at Sardis. One thing is that Jesus had no commendations whatsoever for them in that. I told you one time when we were in uh, Panola County, <laughs> we were about 10 miles west of Sardis over there, where they had a Sardis mail address. And... Uh, one thing, their town was named Sardis, which is simply the church here that uh, had no accommodations in it. Another one, they had the zip code 38666, and that did upset them a great deal <laughs> that was there when they had that uh, in there. But, but just a couple of things out of the church at Sardis, and that's what I'm going to mention. If I can find what I want to find, and sometimes if I don't write it down, I don't have that. But you'll notice, first of all, if we start reading in, 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 in chapter 1, it's, uh, 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 verse 1 of chapter 3, okay? And this right here, he says, These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. In other words, Jesus is simply saying, okay, this I, I, I hold everything in. Now, to me, and, and, and I told you last week, I'm, I'm not a history student whatsoever. So, you know, I, I read some things, and in, in my state now, Harlan, I can't remember what I read. So if I don't write it down or do something with it, but I, I believe, and this is my belief, and this is a lot of other people's belief, and I don't think that it, it, it's originally from me. I, most things are not originally from me. But I think when God wrote these letters, or when God dictated these letters to John to write them, then he, these are real churches that he delivered the letters to, okay? And these were real churches that they were circulated around to each one of the churches that was there in that. But I think that God had a bigger purpose in mind than just simply those seven churches that was there. Uh, and I, I think that he, he had a message. And, and, and what I have read and what I have studied, and I told you when I started the, anything in the book of Revelations, I usually depend upon Adrian Rogers or W.A. Crystal to, to give me anything out of that because I like what they say. David Jeremiah is another one, but he doesn't say a whole lot about this and that. But uh, both of them that I read and most of the people that I read in their commentaries believe that that when God wrote these, then he was given a history of all of the churches throughout all of the ages. And, and you will notice in, the, in the, the last church that we will do, which will be the church at Laodicea next week, at the very end of that church, he gives a very pointed invitation, okay? And then immediately following that, he calls John up into heaven. And you don't see the church from there until uh, the 19th chapter, I think it is again, that is there. So I think he gives a, a picture of all of that. And I think that, that, that when he's talking to this church at Sardis and he's talking to the church at Philadelphia, then he is pointing to a specific period of what's going to happen in church history. Now, we went through the church at, uh, and y'all have to remind me, okay? We went through the church at Pergamos, and in the church at Pergamos, the church began to, began to in, intermingle themselves with the world. Not much, just a little bit, okay? In fact, they had begun to become, um, unit, I call it Unitarian. I, I don't know how that's a good word or not, but, but basically... They, one person in the church began to dominate the church and what the church believed in that. And, uh, and, and, you know, most people back then, they had no reading material or they could not read at all. And so when one person stated it, this became a fact. And they really did not sit down and, and you know, been, been able to research out what, what the person is saying. And that's something you should do. I don't care who's behind this pulpit. When that person, you should have a Bible, you should follow along with them. It doesn't make a difference what, you know, version of the Bible you have. 
but you should be able to follow along with them. And then, to be honest with you, if you think they say something that's not right, go on and research it. Find out for yourself. You need to do that because if you don't do that, then then basically one person can dominate, or, or what I what I say, or what any other preacher says up here can just simply sway your opinion on on things. And and you need to stick with God's word. You need to stick with the Bible, and and you have that ability to do that. Well, back then they didn't have that ability to do that. And so they literally began to do that. And then when we came to the church at Tyre Tyra, then we find out that they had literally just uh, invited people, you know, into the church or actually invited the church to go out and just mingle with the people and become like them and to do things that they, they did in that. And then you come to the church at Sardis. And the comment that he makes about the church at Sardis, and I don't know that I can find that and be with me if I can, okay? Uh, uh, okay, um, uh, I can't, okay, but he says something long right here in the end of verse, uh, end of verse one, I think it is, right here, he says, I know your works, that you have a name, that you were alive, but really you are dead. Now, if we take this during a period church, then I believe that this would be the period probably from somewhere around 1000 uh, AD to probably 1500 AD. It would be the time of the Crusades. And at that point, the church became the government. I was reading a, a little bit this week about the Crusades, and all the Crusades basically was begun by the Pope that really wanted to go out and either defend some territory or capture some other territory. But literally the Crusades were begin because of that. And, and I think at that point right there that the church and, and, and the, the state was so close together, and they literally became one that was there. And I think that's the period that Sardis was in. And, and, and they, would have, they would have been a church that had a great influence. They would have been a church that, that probably had great power as far as power is concerned. And so everybody that looked at them, they would have, they would have literally uh, been amazed. And that's not a good word either, but you'll have to forgive me for choosing some words. But they would have been amazed at... Uh, at uh, the size of the church, the, uh, the, the church, the power that the church had, literally the money, the, the riches that the church had at that point, they would have been amazed at all of that. And so the church really thought, hey, man, we are a powerful being. We are really alive as far as the church is concerned. But God simply said, no, you're not alive. You're a dead church. Because they had a church a congregation, if you would, or a membership. But the most important thing they didn't have, they didn't have the Spirit of God that would lead in them in it. So God says in this right here, he says, okay, you are a church, but you have no spirit. And a church without the Spirit of God is a dead church. I mean, that's just dead. Uh, we were discussing last Monday, and y'all forgive me for dragging this on, but we were discussing last Monday about, uh, about dead Christians in that. And a Christian and a person without Jesus Christ, without the Spirit of God inside of them, as far as God is concerned, they're dead. Uh, if you go back to the book of Colossians, then the uh, first thing that Paul says to them in the, in the second chapter, he says, you were dead in trespasses and sin. You were dead. Separated from God. No spirit whatsoever. And if you don't have a spirit, then basically you are dead. And a church that does not have a spirit of God inside of them is a dead church. Sardis had no spirit about them, so they were dead. One other thing, though, I want you to notice about this right here is... Um, uh, you'll have to forgive me again, okay? Uh, over in, uh, in verse 4, he says, You have a few names, even at Sardis, a few names, even at Sardis, who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white. In other words, there was still a group of people that was in that church. There was still a group of people 
that really was searching for God and, and really trusted God and depended upon God. They may not have known everything there was to know about God. And they may not have known everything there was to know about Jesus Christ, but they, they trusted God and they trusted what they what they believed in that right there. And they still did their dead level best to live uh, for God and they had their faith in Jesus Christ. Every church has that. I, I've got a sermon on Elijah, and one of the things that I told you last week that, that I, you know, that amazed me about Elijah was that Elijah, when he became so depressed, and uh, Jezebel was after him, and he went out and he walked out on the cliff, really, basically, as I picture this thing right here, and he looked at it and he said, God, I'm the only one, I'm the only one that has put my faith in you and I'm the only one that is serving you. And God uh, came down with a voice and he said, no, you're not. No, you're not. He said, I've got a hundred sitting right over yonder that's, that's serving me. You're not the only one. You're not by yourself in this. No matter what you think, you're not by yourself in this. But that's the church of Sardis. It was a dead church. And then we come to a period that I, I call the evangelistic period. If you're going to take this thing in periods of this right here. And that's the church in Philadelphia. Let me just start. I think it's in verse 7. Okay. And then we'll start reading there. And just read a little bit. And he said to the angel of the church at Philadelphia write. These things says he who is holy. And he who is true. True. And he who has the king of David. Has the key of David. He who opens and no one shuts. And shuts and no one opens. You're coming to a whole new thing. Now, I don't know everything that happened in this, but I, I've got my own opinion, and you can take it for what it's worth because I want you to know that it's strictly my opinion, okay? But I believe that one of the things that brought this back was the ability to put God's Word into people's hands. Uh, Gutenberg, I think that's his name, had, had made the printing press and done that. But in 1600, then uh, James the second, I think it was, got a group of people together, and they really took the Greek and the Hebrew Bible, and they really put it into, in that day and time, everybody's language. So they were able to read, they were able to read. And I think when they did that, that there became a new source of power that came in the church. Of course, we know that in Germany, Martin Luther had come and he had become completely dissatisfied with the Catholic Church because the Catholic Church had become so corrupt until the priest was really praying, uh, taking money and telling people, hey, okay, you come and pay me up. Uh, we'll just say $1,000, okay, and I'll guarantee that your, your family is going to go to heaven. Okay? You may, may be in purgatory right now, but if you come and pay me this money, then we're going to pray them into heaven. And Martin Luther really realized, hey, this is not right. This is not right. Sins are not forgiven by an individual, but sins are forgiven by God. Okay? And that. And, and literally, he, uh, he came to the, to the fact of the book of Revelations where it says that uh, uh, salvation is by, by grace and not by works. And he began to open up the world to people in that. And, and he began to Protestant religion in that. And I realized that, that uh, they, they were really, at that point right there, very close to the Catholic Church. But they, they really began to put their focus back on Jesus Christ at that point. And faith in Jesus Christ. And then when that happened, then... Uh, what he says right here to them right here, he, let me go back and read this again if you can bear, bear with me, okay? Uh, he, he goes, really, he doesn't take, you know, most everything we've read about when Jesus described himself to the churches came out of the first chapter. This right here deviates from that because he goes to Isaiah 22, verse 22, when he talks about this church right here. He says that I'm holy. First of all, I'm holy. Now, God being holy doesn't, well, and we know that God was perfect, okay? But I've told you before here, when we say that somebody here is holy or somebody here is saintly, it doesn't mean that they're perfect. They just simply means that they're set apart. They're different. And God was holy because he was completely different than everything else. And you understand that, 
I, and, and again, this is my opinion and nobody else's, not even Adrian Rogers or, but this is my opinion on this right here. I think what he's saying is this right here. Hey, so you're so mixed in with the world. You're so tied in with the world. And you have literally mixed me in with the world. But I want you to understand I'm separate from the world. I'm holy. I'm different. And when you worship me, you're worshiping somebody that is entirely different here. He says, first of all, I'm holy. I'm set apart. I'm not part of this out here. When we worship God, we worship God as a holy God. And I told you a couple of times what time I'm here. I, I have a hard time sometimes when I sit down and I pray to God and, and picture who I am praying to. I have a hard time with that at times. I mean, I really do. Because sometimes, and, and we should talk to God as if God was right next to us, okay? But when we talk to God, we're talking to somebody that is far above us. Somebody that is so different from us. Somebody that is set apart and somebody that has the ability to do all things and that. He is holy. He is different. And he wanted them to understand, listen to me, you mix me in with the world, but you can't do that. Because I'm different than the world. And then he says in here, he says uh, that he, uh, he gives the key of David. And this goes back to, to, to the book of, uh, of Isaiah. And the key of David was power, authority. To be able to enter the king's chamber would have been literally entering into the power of the king that was there. So when he says this right here, he says, uh, you, uh, I give uh, I, uh, a key, and he says, uh, and this, let me see if I can find it again, okay? Yeah, I have set before you an open door. An open door is freedom to move about. And I think that that was what was happening at this time right here. I think, I think that, that the church was beginning to evangelize. The church was beginning to reach out for Jesus Christ. And when they did that right there, if you read on down through here, okay, and uh, see if I can find this again, and, and I should have be better prepared as far as finding all of this stuff than that. Than that. He, says, he says, see, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it, for you have a little strength and have kept my word and have not denied my name. I've given you that open door. I've given you that freedom to proclaim the gospel. I don't know whether that was a, a freedom that was done that before, but I think when Martin, Martin Luther came out, I think that there became a freedom at that point for people to express their opinion, uh, to break it away from this idea that everything that this person says right here is law. I've got to bow down to that. I've got to believe that. And I think what he's saying right here to that point right there is, listen, I'm giving you a new territory. I'm giving you an opportunity to break out of that and to go out and to reach people for Jesus Christ. I may have the wrong opinion of what that is, but that's kind of when I read this. This is kind of what I think about. And then I thought about, hey, what all was going to happen in all of this right here? And I told you this morning, because I got started to doing just a little bit of research, and, and, uh, and I'll do this. Now, let me say one other thing about this. Is he says that you have little power. Now that can be taken two ways. One is, it can be taken that they were a very small congregation, that they were a very small group of people, and that they really did not, as the church back in the, uh, the Dark Ages, the Crusades and all of that, was a very powerful dynamic church. And even, even the, the Catholic church, even in this age, would have been still a very dynamic church. But this little legend of people, they, they were just there. There was not a whole lot of unity about the whole thing. It was just simply a movement that was beginning. And I think they call it a grass fire movement, do they not? To where it just kind of, one little starts here and one starts over here and one starts over here and another one starts and it just kind of spread that way. And that was what was going to happen. And this right here, you have very little strength. But then things begin to happen. And people begin to reach out for Jesus Christ. 
and evangelists or, or just people, some of them not even preachers at that time, began to literally seek what God can do. People like George Whitefield, it literally took England to by storm. And I mean, changed the whole nature of that. England was like all the others. They had the Church of England, and it was the strength of England and all of that. And he began to come, and he began to preach, and he began to proclaim Jesus Christ. People like George Feeney that took that right there, they called him the first professional evangelist, I guess you would, that literally reached all across the country. Dwight L. Moody, and Dwight L. Moody was, was in America at that time. And he was a shoe salesman. And he began orphanages and he began the church and the Moody Institute is still in Chicago right now that is a strong, strong advocate for Jesus Christ that was up there. But Moody went to um, England and he was supposed to have a two-week revival in England and it lasted for two years. God's word, he, God just simply opened the door. And it's kind of like opening the floodgates of a, of, a, of a reservoir, if you would. And it just kind of gushed forth in that because people were dependent upon God's power. That you're a little strength. And another thing about that right there was that they were not dependent on their own strength. They were not dependent, like we said today. They were not dependent upon their own abilities. But they were trusted in what God could do. And I believe it was Dwight L. Moody that said... I'd like to see what one man that completely trusts in Jesus Christ, what God can do with that person. Then he turned around and he said, no, I'm going to be that person. And he was. Jonathan Edwards, I talked to, I, I mentioned him this morning. Jonathan Edwards to me is an amazement. Jonathan Edwards wrote out his sermons, stood in the pulpit right here, Head down, read every word, word by word, by word, by word, by word. And yet, hundreds of thousands of people flock to hear him preach. And thousands of people were saved under his ministry. And as I said this morning, his great sermon centers in the hands of an angry God. It's still printed and still preached throughout. I mean, still, well, not preached word for word like he preached it, but in that right there. And it was nothing more than the power of God that was reaching out through him. But he preached it was so dynamic. And the reason that he had the dynamics was that he literally believed what he was preaching. And Brother David, that makes a difference, doesn't it? And you stand behind this pulpit and you really believe what you are preaching, there's a whole different attitude that comes forth. And Jonathan Edwards was that type of person that was there. Billy Sunday. Billy Sunday was a baseball player that became an evangelist. Went all across America preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Unorthodox. In fact, I read someplace that there was a man that came forward one time and when he had the altar call and, and there was this man down here and he had a long beard and said, Billy Sunday reached out and said, honk, honk, on put it on his beard. <laughs> Very unorthodox, but God used him. And God used these men. He opened the door. So stand still, Bobby. He opened the door and it just simply kind of gushed through. Wouldn't it be wonderful today if we saw a revival like that? The Great Welsh Revival. And that's another one that's always amazed me. I mean, that, that just, I, I read about that and it just amazed me. It was a revival that was simply started as a group of people to get together to study God's Word and pray. And it just simply burst and spread and it literally spread into other parts of the world. But right there, and that right there, for two years I read, two years the revival went on. For two years, the police had absolutely nothing to do because there was no crime whatsoever. For two years, the bars 
and the other joints that was there completely shut down. Churches were full. People that had never been in church before was coming in. Now, I believe that that's the age that we're talking about in the Church of Philadelphia. That great outreach church that was there. He opened the door and nobody could close it. No matter how hard they tried, they could not stop the word of God. This morning in Sunday school, or in our, our Sunday school anyway, we were going back to where Peter and, and John went to the uh, beautiful gate, and there was a man that was healed down there. They healed him, and, and they began to preach, and, and, uh, and they tried to stop it. And Peter looked at him, and he said, are we going to obey you, or are we going to obey God? You decide which one we should obey. And nothing could stop that move. They tried to. Paul tried to. Paul tried to drug people out into the streets of the early church. And he did everything he possibly could to stop Christianity. When people come to the point of putting their faith in Jesus Christ and letting him work through them, there is nothing, nobody can shut that door. God will open it. He keeps it open. And it's like I said, brother, but it's kind of like a floodgate. It just bursts through. That's the church at Philadelphia that was there. Now, the commission in that, I gave them an open door that was there, in there, but he also gives them a promise, if you would. If I can find this right here again, and I know I'm running over, so forgive me, okay? He says, uh, I know your works. I have said before you an open door. In verse 9, he says, Indeed, I will make those who are the synagogue of Satan, who say they are Jews and are not, and they will come down and bow before you. Okay, in verse 10, he says, Because you have kept the commandment to uh, persevere, I will keep you from the hour of the trial. Now, he promised them a couple of things up in here. He may promise them a pillar, which was strength in doing that. Again, forgive me if you disagree with me because you've got that right. As somebody said, you've got the right to be wrong as anybody else does. No, that's all right. Because you understand that the Bible really doesn't pinpoint to us specifically the order of Jesus' is coming. We know that there's going to be two times that Jesus is going to come. One time, he's going to come for the church. There are some that believe that he's going to come before the tribulation ever starts. I believe that, okay? And I will talk about that. If I'm here in two or three weeks, we'll talk about that. I believe he's going to come before the church. And I believe that's what he's telling this group right here. He says, I'm going to keep you from that time of trouble. And it wasn't that those people did not have time a people or, or people that was against them during, during the time that they were preaching. But I simply believe that he's saying to them, hey, listen, you're not going to have to go through all the trouble that these Jews are going to have to go through. I'm going to keep you from that. There's some that believe that, you're going to, that he's going to go all the way through, uh, about halfway through the, uh, the tribulation, which will be three and a half years, and, and he takes them on. We'll talk about that later on also. Then there are some that believe that, hey, listen, church is going to go through the whole tribulation and just kind of migrate into the thousand years that is there. That everything that you talk about in the book of Revelations, everything you talk about in the book of Daniel has already happened. Ezekiel has already happened. Everything has already gone about. I just simply believe that God is going to take us out. I hope. For people, I don't want to go through that time. I don't want to go through that time. And I think that's what he's telling this church right here. But he makes that promise. I'm going to keep you. And I'm going to keep you from harm. And he could have been saying another thing also. He could have been saying, listen, you go on and you stay faithful to me. You go on and you proclaim my word. You go on and you reach out to these people. And these people are not going to be able to stop you or hurt you or stop you in doing that. I'm going to be with you and I'm going to protect you and I'm going to keep you. 
And I'm not real sure that not a, not a promise that we're going to need. Because I'll be perfectly honest with you, I'm not real sure that if the Lord tarries, and I don't think he's going to, that there's going to come a day that a person is going to have to be very careful what they say behind this pulpit. Or they're going to face government charges. I believe that. Now that's my belief. I don't that scare anybody about it. That's just simply my belief. And I don't believe it's that far off. But I think that what God says is, you go ahead and proclaim my word. I'll take care of all of that. I'll take care of all of that. But God is the one that began the revival. God is the one that changes people's lives during the revival. And God is the one that can open the doors. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we saw that today? Wouldn't it be wonderful if we saw revivals like the wealth revival where you didn't turn on your TV every night and find that 10 people have been shot by somebody? Wouldn't it be wonderful to do that? Listen, I don't know that it's going to happen, but it's not going to happen. It's not going to not happen because God don't want it to happen. I know there's about three double negatives in that thing, but that's all right. When you, I think God, I think, I think people in heaven would dance and roar like everything if they just simply saw that grass fire movement starting in America today and spreading throughout all the world. Dear precious Heavenly Father, Lord, dear Lord,